Hello, I'm Tony Gaida. This is my New York. We begin today with two intimate, very personal photos of a former mayor of New York. Neither, I believe, has ever been seen before. That is John Lindsay, of course. But what is he doing? And who is the woman? Well, Mr. Mayor, what is that all about? And who is that woman? That woman is my guest. You'll meet her next. That photograph is fascinating. Let's look at it again. Mayor John Lindsay in what looks like a very passionate moment. The woman involved can now be revealed. She is Irene Cornell, the doyen of radio news in this town after an illustrious career on WCBS 880 Radio. It is great to see you. Irene. Great to see you, Tony. That photograph, I can't get over those two photographs. Tell me about it. Where, where well, did that happen? When did that happen? Well, first, those photos were so deep in my closet, <laughs> you wouldn't believe. They truly had never been seen except by a few members of my family. Uh, this happened on John Lindsay's last day in office as mayor of New York City. Now, I had covered him for years uh, at City Hall when he ran for president, mm -hmm. went to Wyoming and Florida where he got chased out by former residents of Queens who still remember the snowstorm. <laughs> so, but Lindsay was such a distant figure to me. I had the impression that he never even knew who I was, even though I'd covered all his news conferences and followed mm -hmm. him as sure. a presidential candidate. Then on this last day, he was speaking at a school in the city, an elementary school. And I was standing at the at the stage, just standing there with my microphone through this whole, his little farewell speech to the city. And suddenly he just approached me and came over and I didn't really know what was happening. I just smiled at him and then suddenly smack that, <laughs> at that big smackaroo. And that was it. You know, I never said anything to anybody about this. Your reaction? Were you startled? Were I was you very, flattered? I were was you both. <laughs> He's a very handsome guy. I was startled and flattered and thought, whoa, what was that about? And that was the last time I ever saw John Lindsay. And what was it about? Did anybody, did Lindsay's staff ever say anything to you? Did he ever say anything? He never said a word. His staff never said a word. This was a room full of reporters and photographers. No one said anything. And I kind of forgot about it until these photos arrived in the mail. <laughs> they were taken by a daily news photographer who just quietly sent them to me. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> what happened there? Well, that raises so many questions, I read. A daily news photographer took the pictures. It was a public event. There were other reporters in the room. Packed uh, with reporters. Nobody ever said it. You never reported it. You never said any. Did you ever tell your boss? No. No. And so a room full of reporters on, on an important day, the mayor's last day right. in, in office, nobody, it never made the papers, it, there was never a wor public word about this. How is that possible? That's the way it was in the 70s. If, um, if a reporter ran into JFK smooching a movie star in a hotel staircase, which did happen, it would never be reported. Now... That is what's so different about then and now. Well, I'm thinking about then and now, and, and the point you uh, perhaps are about to make. I mean, if that happened now, it would, in the, in the modern parlance, go viral all over the world in seconds. And there would be a firestorm, don't you think? There would probably be a bit of an uproar. Or some, somebody would certainly have reported what happened, but not then. Nobody said a word except my husband when I showed him the photographs. <laughs> my husband, Danny Meenan, great New York Street reporter. Right. WMCA. WMCA. <laughs> he, was, he was one of a kind, Danny. He looked at these photos and he said, lips that touched Lindsley's will never touch mine. <laughs>
and of course using the the pejorative Lindsay. Lindsay, yeah. <laughs> given to him by Michael J. Quill, right? Who led the first transit strike on Lindsay's first day in office? The judge can <laughs> the judge can drop dead in his black robes. I Absolutely. think Michael Mike Quill uh, said when they. Uh, what was it, an injunction against a transit strike? That's right. And he also said when my husband asked him the day before the strike, aren't you bluffing, Mr. Quill? He said, you may be walking, Danny. <laughs> and we all were. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I thank you for sharing those pictures with us. I, I, can't, I, I can't imagine it happening. Um, uh, and I just we can just speculate as we've been about what would happen today if if something like that happened. Well, one thing is at, at that we were always taught growing up in the news business that you know I was not the story. Mm -hmm. The story was Mayor Lindsay's last day in office. But I'm surprised, and I know those times were different. But I'm surprised that no other reporter in that room saw fit to talk about it, even perhaps to you, or, or at least one of them, say something uh, as a footnote <laughs> to their story or something like that. I just can't imagine. As far as I know, nothing was ever said. <laughs> Anybody it's who funny listened, when you think of it. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's remarkable. Anybody who listens to, to radio news in this town uh, or has ever listened to radio news in this town has listened to you, uh, knows you, uh, feels like they probably uh, know you better than actually they do. Uh, and you've always described the job as fun. What makes it fun? Every day is so much fun. I mean courts became my life. I started out as a general assignment reporter mm -hmm. doing everything, you know, from fires and water main breaks and city hall to education, railroads, whatever. But once I got into a courtroom, it was just uh, delightful to me. I mean, you can sit, a lot of people don't like to cover trials because there can be hours of boredom interrupted by just instants or moments of either great drama or quiet drama or revelations of you know very surprising things it's it's like being and having a front row seat in the theater every single day and so um i've never gotten tired of it in all of these many years what inspired you to become a reporter i guess i grew up in the family of reporters and thinking about it my dad was a newsman uh television radio newspapers the whole bit when he did have a TV show, we never had a TV at home. Really? Right. He wouldn't allow it. <laughs> so, kind of an odd yeah, uh, rule. Yeah. He didn't television. want us watching TV. You know, if I wanted to see Leave It to Beanie, I had to go to a neighbor's house. So we'd sit around the dining room table at night and talk about the news stories that my dad had covered during the day. And that's the way I grew up. So it was kind of implanted at a very early age. And uh, my uncle was religion editor of the Associated Press for 40 years. And then, uh, you know, my kids started getting into the business. Yeah. And your sister is a very well-known and respected courtroom artist. Right. Um, your dad had a television. He was an anchorman here in New York on the old Dumont Network, right? Right. WABD, Channel 5, for people who perhaps remember it. Right. Um, left there and went to Savannah, as I understand it. What happened there? Well, Dumont folded. Ah. So he got the job in, um, in Savannah. He was the news director at a station called WSGA Radio. Mm hmm <clears throat> So we spent, um, well, we were actually in Savannah for four years until my dad reported something that was very unpleasant for Savannah society. Mm. And uh, Savannah doesn't hold with that. Uh, I know. I worked there. <laughs> it's a very insular place. Yeah. Or it actually, was then. Yeah. Well, actually, what happened was there was a, a little obituary notice in the Savannah News uh, about Harriet Train Blake, who had been, it, it said she was a suicide. Mm -hmm. And my dad got a call from a police source who said, uh, look into this, Cam. It was actually... 
a shotgun blast to the back of the head. Mm. And my dad, Cameron Cornell, reported that uh, Harriet Train Blake, who was the daughter of the owner of the radio station and the TV station and the newspaper in Savannah, (laughs) uh, was not actually a suicide, but it was a homicide. And what he didn't report was that it was uh, her lesbian lover who had shot her. And this is in the early 50s in Savannah. And anyone who's seen Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil or read the book would know that such homicides are quickly covered up. So my dad was told, you report that one more time, Cornell, that it was a homicide and you're gone. My dad says, but I was hired to be the news director to report the news. So he went on the next hour, same story, and he was fired. Blackballed in Georgia, by the way, could not get a job anywhere. Really? Yeah. What year was this? It was um, 59. Did that discourage, it obviously didn't discourage you at all from... from it was a lesson in, um, you know, how to stand up for what's right and for truth in reporting. And my dad was not afraid, even though he was followed around in dark vans and cars every time he went out. He, he just was not afraid. And so... I, and he always said getting fired was the best thing that ever happened to him, and we came back to New York. So. There's, a, there's a lesson about intimidation in that, too, to how to deal with those who might try to intimidate. Um, That's and right. I think you, a lesson you <clears throat> took, I think you told me this, uh, you, a lesson you took into your relationship, as it were, reporter to to a person to report on, by a person by the name of John Gotti, at one of his trials that you covered, um, there was some intimidation going on, which uh, sounded a little scary to me, but tell us the story. Well, this was his fourth and final trial. And uh, at one point, a young woman testified against John Gotti And this was the first time a family member, and especially Mm. a young female, took a witness stand to say that John Gotti ordered the execution of her father, who was also a mobster. But this was young woman had great courage. And I reported that John Gotti could not bring himself to look at the woman. So the next day, I'm in court taking my notes, and another reporter says to me, "Uh, one of Gotti's guys is looking for you. I said, okay. As I kept taking okay, my notes. That's what <laughs> yeah, <said> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So then I was out in the phone booth. We had those then <laughs> calling in my story and there's a rap on the phone booth and it's Lewis Kassman who was one of Gotti's closest lieutenants. He would considered himself Gotti's adopted son. And he said to me, my friend John doesn't like what you said on the radio. Mm. Now, my first reaction was, who? John Miller? (laughs) Because, as you remember, Miller was always following Gotti around with his microphone, and that was my first thought. John Miller, for our audience, (laughs) used to be a great police reporter in this town and is now a high official at the police. In charge of anti-terrorism. At at the NYPD. Right. So anyway, that was kind of an aside. But anyway, he said, no, John Gotti, my best friend in the world, John Gotti doesn't like Mm. what you said on the radio. So I'm having visions of Gotti sitting in his cell at night with his little transistor radio (laughs) listening to me and not liking what I'm saying. So I said to Mr. Kasman, well, what does it, what was it that Mr. Gotti did not like? I'll fix it right up. (laughs) And, (laughs) And Kasman said, He doesn't like that you said the woman, he couldn't look at the woman. The reason he couldn't look at the woman is not because he's guilty, but because she's an unmarried woman. He doesn't know her. He doesn't know her mother. And it would be wrong to look at her. A very proper. Very proper. Don. Don. So, yeah, the proper Don. Right. So, So I said to Kasman, will you tell Mr. Gotti that, that I'll correct that. So the way I corrected it was to go on every half hour, all day long, repeating my version and then telling the audience what Mr. Gotti didn't like and why. 
So that way I figured I would keep the black hand of the mafia away from my home. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I credit your, your, your steadfastness. I, it scares me just to hear the story. I, now, when he finally got sentenced, uh, there was a moment. You remember that moment? Oh, I certainly do. This was a federal court in Brooklyn. And uh, the judge was I, Leo Glasser, who didn't care for the press much. So when the jury came in with its verdict in lunch hour, when the press was all across the street in what we called the bad guy cafe having lunch, he decided to take the verdict like 10 minutes past one, lunch hour. I happened to be in the courthouse because I was waiting for my sister Christine, the artist, to finish washing the chalk off her hands. And I saw the court officers all talking into their walkie-talkies and getting very excited. And I thought, whoops, something's going on. I went back to the courtroom, and they brought John Gotti in. And it's me and John Gotti in the room. They took off his cuffs. He did his classic shooting his cufflinks gesture, turned around to me, and had a little half-smile on his face. He knew what was coming. And he just winked at me. Really? And I figured, well, I guess... All is forgiven. <laughs> and then he was convicted. <laughs> and the place went mad. The FBI uh, director rushed in and declared that um, oh, the uh, Teflon Don had just become the Velcro Don because right. all the charges yeah. stuck. How does it feel to be winked at by John Gotti? <laughs> or kissed by John Lindsay? <laughs> I don't know. You had some career. <laughs> It was just, a, it was a very interesting moment. It really was. You've won so many awards for your reporting, and I think among the first was for your coverage of the Alice Crimmins trial. Alice was a, as I recall, a cocktail waitress, pretty good-looking cocktail waitress who was accused of murdering her children. Uh, what stands out from that trial? Uh, what do you recall today that just, you know, is impressed on your... Memory bank. Well, that was another sign of the Times trial. She was referred to constantly as the attractive red-haired cocktail waitress. She was very conscious of her looks and her makeup. Mm. The detectives were suspicious of her from day one because on the way to uh, view the body of one of her children that had just been found by a highway, uh, she was putting on makeup in the back seat. And, um, you know, it turned out she was just very self-conscious and wanted to appear her best. Mm -hmm. But this was a moment, I mean, on the way to look at a dead child. So the cops were relentless in going after her. And she's a woman who was convicted because of her sex life and because it all came out because she took the witness stand. And it opened her up to all of these random casual love affairs, Picasso the barber, people, you know, it was just, a, it was a sideshow. It was a circus. And did you, uh, uh, she was convicted on this, what we might call circumstantial, her lifestyle. Her lifestyle. And did the jury do the right thing in your estimation? Oh, another thing, it was an all-male jury. Ah. And, uh, you know, there was a bit of, you know, a woman can't, live like this. They just thought that she was a scandalous woman. Mm. And people would say, a woman like that? Uh, there was a lock on the outside of the children's bedroom door mm. where she would lock them in during her love tryst. That was another big black mark against her, you know. And, and the thinking was by the prosecutor that she got rid of her children in order to, uh, because they were in the way of her lifestyle. And do you think lifestyle was a was a, a valid reason for convicting her? Nope. I never thought I never could believe that she did it. And uh, the first trial, she was convicted. Uh, the verdict was thrown out because a juror broke the rules and went to visit the scene. Mm -hmm. Second trial, she was convicted again. And at the end of that trial, I, I really, I just viscerally, emotionally couldn't believe that she'd done it. I mean, in this day, mothers didn't kill their children anyway, especially 
in a nice neighborhood in Queens where she lived, you know, mm. Kew Gardens. So um, I was in a phone booth crying because I didn't, I couldn't believe that she'd been convicted. I was very young too. <laughs> and um, at that point I was married to Danny Mean and he came and he pounded on the, <laughs> another pounding on the phone booth. <laughs> and he said, stop blubbering and get on the air. So I did. <laughs> But And that second verdict was thrown out, too, because the prosecutor had broken the rules and said to the jury in his closing argument, she doesn't have the guts to get up here and tell you that she didn't kill her children. Yeah. And in that second trial, Alice had learned you do not take the witness stand because her whole background would come out again. And the, ju- and the, uh, the prosecutor broke the rules because you cannot hold a uh, defendant's unwillingness to testify against her. Against them, All right. You're renowned for your trial coverage. There are so many big names and so many uh, big trials. Uh, I, I, I want to jump to another part of your illustrious career. Um, when, when Rockefeller was governor and Lindsay was mayor, uh, they didn't like each other. But you are among the, maybe the only reporter who actually heard them and reported them cursing each other out. I want to know about that. Yeah, well, this happened. They were at some affair together, and it was the first time they'd been together since their row started. Governors and mayors always fight, and this was a particularly bitter one. And uh, I was just hanging around there, (laughs) standing behind a pillar, when I heard Rockefeller and Lindsay start to curse at each other. And so... I didn't have a tape recorder rolling at the time. I didn't even have one with me. It was just one of these Mm -hmm. things where you're walking around with politicians. And so it was not on tape. And if I had been able to stick my microphone around the pillar, they would have (laughs) dispersed very quickly. It would have been over. So I just kept quiet and listened. and, And made notes. And made notes. And went on the air and reported that they had literally nearly come to blows and they were certainly verbally assaulting each other. And words apparently you couldn't use on the air. Oh, oh no. Even though this is public television, I probably can't use them (laughs) now. Can't even use them now, right? Always had to be careful about that on radio. But um, so it did become a big story and it was picked up by columnists and in the newspapers. This is one where one of my little secret moments did get reported. And pretty violent stuff. You, you yeah. yeah, yeah. It was really, it was really interesting because they they'd managed to keep up a public face, even though we knew they were fighting behind the scenes. But right. here, it they just let it all hang out. Some of the names, the trials that you've covered, I go down the list: Bess Meyerson, uh, Leona Helmsley, Martha Stewart, Imelda Marcos, Buddy Jacobson, who was a uh, a trainer, I think, of uh, a horse trainer, and so many other things. At Puff Daddy or P. Diddy, under which name was he tried and you were covering? Well, he was tried under his real name, given name, which is Sean Combs. Okay, and what public name was he using? <clears throat> he, was, he was Puff Daddy at the time. Okay. Now he's P. Diddy. <laughs> then he was Puff Daddy. And there, there was a wonderful moment during that trial. And this is one of the things that made me love trials, waiting for these little moments he was represented by his own dream team. He had Ben Brothman, mm. one of the best lawyers in the city. You know, when uh, mm-hmm. David Letterman gets in trouble, who does he call? Ben Brothman. He's, he's just a wonderful lawyer. And Johnny Cochran from the O.J. Simpson dream team. So here he had these great lawyers. And uh, Puff Daddy was really quite put out that he had to be in a courtroom at all. He was charged with attempted murder. Four shots had been fired in a club where he was holding a party. He was buying $400 bottles of champagne for everyone. And a couple of people got shot. Puff Daddy took off in his SUV with his main squeeze at the time, J-Lo, Jennifer Lopez. I remember this. So they're speeding up the West Side Highway, and the cops stop him for speeding, and they find this gun in his car. So he's charged with attempted murder. 
he is very upset at having to come to a courtroom. And this one day he comes in and he has a fashion show opening that day, which explains his upset. So he had to leave the fashion show, come to court, face trial. He comes in late, takes off his elegant camel's hair coat, tosses it to a paralegal, sits down, and then he extends both arms to Ben Brofman and Johnny Cochran so that they can fasten his gold and diamond cufflinks. They can fasten, fasten them? his cufflinks. And they do, looking very <laughs> <laughs> flustered and humiliated. They didn't know they had signed on as Puffy's valets, <laughs> as they say in, <laughs> in old England. Yeah, the valets. <laughs> the valets. <laughs> uh, amazing. It was, it was just one of those little moments that you don't even, I don't know if anybody else even saw it. A couple that's, of guys fascinating <laughs> is, I don't imagine that's what they thought they were signing on for with their $500 or $800 an hour <laughs> billing fees. Right, right. But they got him off. He, Puffy testified for him in his own behalf. He was much too cute and much too charming to ever convict. So uh, his protege, the rapper Shine, mm. ended up taking the rap and going to prison. And then the last thing that we heard of Shine, just within the last few years, he turned up in Jerusalem at the Wailing Wall where he could, had converted... <laughs> <laughs> and, and he was a practicing Orthodox Jew. We, we have to do. <laughs> we, have, <laughs> we have to do another program. There are so many more trials that uh, we could talk about. Gene Harris, uh, I know, is is uh, that was a that was a whole scene. Irene Cornell, a pioneer in her field, respected by politicians and peers and so many other people. It is a delight to be with you. It's a delight to have been a colleague of yours uh, one or two times in our careers. And, uh, you mean I'm, this is I'm, over now, Tony? <laughs> it, it's, 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 it's over now. At least this is over. And I thank you for being here. Thank you. And thank you for watching. We will see you next week.